Allegis Global Solutions presents the Subject to Talent podcast, a hub for global workforce leaders to unleash the power of human enterprise. Thank you for listening in as we explore the most innovative and transformational topics impacting business today. Hi, I'm Bruce Morton, the host of Allegis Global Solutions Subject to Talent podcast. Today, I'm handing over the microphone to my good friend and colleague, Renee Gorman. Renee has over 20 years of experience in the talent industry, and as a senior manager of market analytics, she's a, as a consumer knowledge of workforce trends for a plethora of industries. Today, she welcomes Anna Wells, the executive editor of Industrial Media, a leading publishing company for multiple manufacturing media outlets. They will discuss the unique advantages, needs, and challenges faced by the manufacturing industry in today's shifting talent landscape. Let's listen in. Thanks for passing the microphone to me today, Bruce. I'm really excited to dive into today's discussion because the challenges that industrial manufacturers and distributors are facing have a wide reach and impact many industries. As executive editor at Industrial Media, Anna communicates to millions of professionals on manufacturing industry news, deals, insights, and user reports, all which guide industry leaders on making business decisions. She also co-hosts the Today in Manufacturing podcast, which focuses on stories that impact the future of the manufacturing industry. Anna, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Great. At AGS's Subject to Talent podcast, we always ask our guests the same first question. So how did you get into the manufacturing industry and specifically the workforce management aspects of the industry? And what was your journey to where you are today? Sure. So um, it all started back in about 2006. I joined a media organization where I was basically assigned a manufacturing beat, if you will. And as a writer, that has meant constant observation um, and research in the industry sense. So we produce a few websites. We have some magazines. We have some podcasts. And it's all related to trends in the industrial market. And of course, um, manufacturing and distribution are so complex and their success or failure is so highly dependent on their talent pool. Uh, So we cover workforce topics, we cover training, safety, digital transformation, all of those key factors, I think, surrounding uh, workforce recruitment and retention. Excellent. Very interesting. Um, So to jump right in, uh, I'll start with a labor supply question. Um, Labor supply challenges continue to plague the manufacturing and distribution space. In recent years, the Great Resignation was really the catalyst for historical wage inflation and Manufacturers now have many new competitors for talent as retailers and hotels and restaurants have all increased wages to attract workers. What are your thoughts on the shifts that that have occurred? Yeah, um, it's a great question. There's a lot going on there. (laughs) You know, you mentioned the great resignation uh, that definitely took a hit on blue collar workers. I think it coincided with a time period where uh, so many manufacturing companies were deemed essential, right, throughout the the pandemic, and workers at at those plants often don't have the luxury of working from home or hiding in an office all day with the door shut. So, really, I think the dynamic with COVID um, certainly added to the decline in retention for some companies who weren't able to offer their workers that flex time that they wanted or needed to either prioritize their health or to juggle childcare. Um, And we saw a lot of companies in manufacturing bend over backwards to try to address those needs for their workers. But in the end, um, the manufacturing industry is just not built for work from home. (laughs) And and then the secondary impact of that, I think, has been, you know, people were fleeing their jobs. The people that were left behind were left bearing the weight of roles and responsibilities that weren't necessarily part of their initial job description everyone was having to wear multiple hats. And so now those workers are just getting burned out. So that's, I think, added to a shortage that has existed for a long time. Um, Manufacturing companies, I think, are feeling that a little bit more now. Um, And so I personally, I believe that it's valuable in the sense that um, that it's it's uh, causing them to make some big changes and really take a second look at their policies, their requirements, how they present themselves to the market and, and possible job candidates. Because right now it's a big problem for some of these companies. And we hear anecdotally about people working in environments where they feel like they can't catch up. Um, and, and that's, of course, 
you know, a concern for those businesses who would maybe take on more business, uh, maybe integrate time saving technologies, but they just don't feel like like they can. So, <laughs> um, so yes, definitely some interesting shifts uh, post pandemic as well, because as you mentioned in your question, there have been some notable increases in wages um, for entry level workers in, in, you know, sectors like hospitality, retail, healthcare, um, which has caused some challenges for manufacturers trying to recruit because there was a long time where those manufacturing jobs were paying more and considered to offer a little bit more opportunity for growth. And now you're seeing manufacturing companies competing for workers with industries that they never did before. And if and if you can go work at Target for $15, $16 an hour starting and the manufacturing plant down the street is offering 16 or 17 and then the perception is that that manufacturing job is maybe harder work or maybe it, you think it might be dangerous. I don't know. You're going to struggle if you're a manufacturer, <clears throat> excuse me, in that case to get some of those folks in the door. Yeah, that's such a good point. And I'll, I'll kind of um, add on to what you mentioned about perception, because another aspect that has drastically reduced prospects for the manufacturing industry is, of course, that more generations, younger generations, I should say, hold four-year degrees than the generations that precede them. And younger workers may not even consider manufacturing as a career path. Can you share some insights on what manufacturing leaders are doing to attract those younger workers? Yeah, um, <clears throat> you know, I, th you're, you're totally right. The manufacturing industry has had a perception problem for so long and it continues. Um, people still look at manufacturing and really despite so much progress that's been made, um, they see it as this dusty old industry. There's maybe not the, the prestige that you see from other industries. So, you know, how do you change that? Uh, we see companies doing a lot with partnerships to seek out younger folks before they're adults and kind of give them a clear look at um, a high tech, clean operating environment. Talk about the career path. So some of that is, you know, manufacturers um, partnering with tech schools or coming in and trying to uh, finance shop programs for local high school or something. Um, and then I think uh, the other responsibility of those manufacturers is really just finding a way to tell their story as a method um, to that recruitment because, uh, you know, you hear more and more about these younger workers and how one of their key uh, objectives when looking for a job is finding a place where they feel like they make a difference, what they're doing matters. And so I think, you know, for manufacturers, th that can be a challenge, right? Like maybe you make a widget um, where does it go? How does it help people? Are these things that you're making, um, you know, f f at the forefront of your messaging when you're trying to speak to some of these prospective candidates? Because um, they really need to clarify some of that. I think they really need to also reinforce that many of the jobs on the plant floor and front office require high skills, even college degrees, that this isn't really your grandfather's factory anymore. It's not just assembly lines. It's oftentimes roles that are really creative and really challenging. And so it's not just hiring a person to assemble something. And in many cases, it's hiring the person who maintains the machine that automates that task or, or you know, that's the kind of stuff that you're seeing more today. And so uh, we, we see um, manufacturers trying to take that seriously. In many cases, it's difficult because they're, you know, they're really trying to to change the way they operate from a hiring standpoint. And of, of course, you know, that's a cultural thing. So that's hard. But um, I think one of the other things that's been important for businesses like that to attract a younger workforce is, um, you know, all the reports and all the research out there says that the younger generation of workers really want to have a seat at the table. They want to feel like they are making an impact day to day. They understand the objectives of the organization. They have goals set for them. They have mentors. They really feel involved instead of just being, you know, a, a cog in the machine, if you will. <laughs> uh, but um, so I think that's another thing that that is really a cultural shift for manufacturing companies that they need to address. You know, they got to get rid of the pecking order. They have to um, get rid of the gate the gatekeepers and, and, and the silos and stuff and really kind of spread things out, give, give team members access to, um, to the executive team and make them understand that, that they're involved in the company's objectives and, and making progress. And this is what the overall goal of the organization is. You know, you can't just like set somebody in an office or on an assembly line and expect that they're going to be happy there. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think assuming that 
Gen Z wouldn't be willing to even step into that line of work is a mistake because they are knowledge seekers and they are the first digital natives that are in the workforce and they're change adopters. And I think we need to start focusing on all the positives that they bring to the table and just evolve the way that we, we engage with them. That's perfect. Um, and then I think, you know, sticking with technological advancements, as is true with all industries today, those advancements are making an impact on um, manufacturing and distribution industries as well. And some would say that companies should invest in reskilling and upskilling their workers to evolve with these changes in order to retain and attract talent. Can you speak a bit more on what kind of advances they should embrace and how that's affecting the future of work? Yeah, definitely. So, um, uh, you know, technology is a big shift in manufacturing. We're seeing investment in automation and digital tools really accelerate in the last couple of years. Uh, there's what we've seen is there's really been a broader acceptance of automation. I think um, the days there, you know, there was a time when there was a lot of fear around automation. People saw it as a, a job killer, right? Um, <laughs> that was a barrier for a long time for a lot of companies. I think businesses have come around on that, which is good. Uh, you're seeing more investment in the last few years in manufacturing verticals outside of automotive. And that's actually very significant because if you look at the data, automotive manufacturing was responsible for a huge chunk of auto automation investments um, for a very long time. Now you're seeing that kind of spread out a little bit, which is, I think, an important, um, you know, an important stepping stone for the industry. Um, I think part of that is due to the fact that um, automation technology companies are meeting these manufacturers halfway. There's a lot of customization that's now being built in, um, and you know, in, in manufacturing, they do a lot of build to order. So there's a lot of smaller companies out there for a long time that were saying like, this automation isn't for me. We don't have a 100,000 square foot plant. We don't have multiple assembly lines. Um, that is changing. Uh, you're seeing that, um, you know, cobots and things like that enter the market. And as they scale, they're becoming more affordable. Uh, the technology has improved to the point where they can work side by side with humans and that and do so safely, right? So, um, so that's that's important to see that some of that technology take off on the plant floor. Um, McKinsey recently said that the automation tipping point is coming for industrial, and depending on the speed of technological advances, that could be sometime in the next five or fifteen years. Um, it just so happens, uh, in my opinion, that that sweet spot for automation is solving a big problem for manufacturers, which is um, the need for labor. So if these jobs are replaced by machines, they never come back, which is a scary prospect. But at the same time, uh, you know, I think you have to like really shave down that rhetoric and, and, and consider, do we want those jobs? Because they've been notoriously hard to fill. Um, there, it's hard to retain people in repetitive, uh, backbreaking work. People don't want those jobs. But what comes along with the automation investment is you can take care of that and also add jobs. The folks that are managing like the productivity dashboards or programming the bots or maintaining the systems. Um, there's a lot of other employment opportunity that comes along with that. So I think that that's sort of the nuanced look that the industry is starting to take around automation and those tech tools that they really need to operate. Oh, that's wonderful. It's, and it's good to hear, too. Um, another, um, another popular topic nowadays is the geo geopolitical landscape. Um, it's very complex. It's always evolving. And a lot of global organizations are choosing to onshore or nearshore. And with some of these countries acting as global manufacturing leaders, how could decoupling impact not only the cost of labor, but an organization's talent attraction strategy? That's a that's a very interesting question. Um, I think I would look at it from the perspective of the the stress to operate in those business conditions. And we saw that a lot during the pandemic. Um, you know, people got burned really hard on stuff that they were like on the phone with their customers daily tracking orders, tr trying to provide updated information, accurate information, trying to provide accurate pricing. <clears throat> and um, and so to me, I think a lot of companies determined in the end, like, hey, this isn't worth it. 
um, we're having such big challenges with um, not just timelines, but quality. And if you look at the the data that we have from our audience of manufacturers and distributors, these are the top things that they look for. Price is not number one for these companies. When they buy products, they want to know that they're high quality products and that they can get them on time. So if both of those things are in flux, um, that's a huge challenge. And I do think from a workforce perspective, it tends to fall on the shoulders of these poor like sales reps and customer service people. And, and so, you know, they need to have reliable partners. They need to be able to um, have business continuity. And if there's delays and challenges around that, um, you know, the shorter supply chain is just fewer links. It just causes more, it, it's more visibility. It's shorter lead times, fewer concerns about, you know, how, how that business relationship is going to go. So it, it impacts these businesses financially. And I think, you know, a lot of workers, again, I hate to use that term burnout again, but a lot of workers got burned out during the pandemic because it was so stressful. <laughs> um, so, you know, to me, I think that it, you know, it helps, uh, it helps those c- companies operate more cleanly. And I do think also if, if everybody's reshoring, it kind of levels the playing field a little bit as well, which makes things easier from a recruiting standpoint for these, these companies. Absolutely. There's so many emerging markets that can be looked at as well as a potential to, you know, to move those resources elsewhere, certainly costly, but to your point in the long run um, could potentially have more of a positive impact impact on, on finances altogether for many organizations, whether they're in the manufacturing and distribution space or not, sustainability is at the top of the list for strategic initiatives. It matters a great deal to stakeholders, to employees, certainly to future employees can you share some examples of sustainable strategies that have been implemented with great success? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, this is an exciting area for me because, uh, you know, I personally just um, it, I'm happy to see the growth of ESG. And um, I, I think it's important that manufacturing companies and industrial distributors take a leadership role here. Um, we're seeing companies in the industrial space ask for help which I think is super productive um, as a way of approaching this. They have done a good job over the years of tackling some of the low hanging fruit regarding energy savings, because that's always had a cost saving incentive to do so. Um, But um, often I think they need some more guidance uh, getting over the hump beyond that. Um, So we see them looking for, uh, like integrated service offerings from their suppliers who are well equipped in many cases to say, go in and do an energy audit and say, here's how you can reduce your compressor energy consumption, for example, and, and here's how you do it. Uh, so they can provide really those consultative um, uh, skills, but also the product solution. And that's, you know, making that more manageable, I think, for industrial end users who kind of don't know where to start on that. Uh, we are seeing some companies as well get behind alternative energy. I recently interviewed a solar company who walked through the changes in solar purchase and ROI with me. And it was really eye opening how much has changed in the terms of, you know, the incentives, um, how these companies um, should also be taking a renewed look at some of the more tried and true solutions. Um, Because anytime legislation passes, you know, you have to look again, like what will my state offer me? What will my, will the federal government offer me if I make some of these changes? Um, So, yeah, again, I think the question's so valid because uh, back to this reputation issue for the industrial market, um, you know, manufacturing has been so long associated with emissions, runoff, <laughs> hazardous chemicals, things like that. And in many cases with good reason. But um, when these companies are trying to target workers uh, where green initiatives truly matter to them, not having a solid or a defined plan there can really make or break it for many job candidates. And I think it's up to these companies to find the solutions, but then also tell that story before, you know, before they lose out on folks who, who think that the industrial space just doesn't do ESG. That's not true at all. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think more than ever, everybody knows that organizations have both a a social, social and a corporate responsibility to make sure. sure that those plans are in place. So for labor, labor unions and um, regulations, that's been another popular topic in the news. In fact, I've heard 2023 referred to already as the year of the strike and balancing labor relations and compliance with labor laws and regulations can be a complex challenge for manufacturing 
and distribution companies. Any thoughts that you'd like to share on that topic? Uh, I, I, I do think that there was um, a very narrow window there where there was a, a ton of leverage that um, was that, that employees had a ton of leverage um, when it came to kind of pushing back and trying to get better working conditions, greater pay. Um, I know that's been a challenge for the business side of it, um, trying to to manage that. Um, and, you know, what does it do to your public brand if your workers strike and how long can you afford for that to happen? And, and you know, what can you afford to increase from a wage and benefit standpoint? Um, so yeah, I don't, I, you know, short of having a crystal ball, I don't know what happens next. I do think that some of the leverage is waning a bit as economic conditions have softened a little, or there's been some recessionary fears. Um, but as long as the job market is, is strong and businesses continue to add jobs and they continue to need workers, um, there will still be some leverage there from, from these workers. And so, um, you know, in manufacturing, you're, the the union membership rate is higher than in most other industries. So in manufacturing, we see a lot of the the strike um, stuff happening, and um, you are seeing a lot of these uh, these workers get what they want or or get close to it. So I you know I don't know what happens next, but it's certainly from my perspective been very interesting to watch. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you alluded to it a little bit already when you mentioned a crystal ball. So. To wrap up our discussion today here on the Subject to Talent podcast, we like to end our episodes with a look to the future. So the crystal ball question, in light of growing adoption of AI and other technological advancements, the the ongoing struggles with um, the labor force and the labor challenges, where do you see the manufacturing industry in five years? So um, I think that's a great question. you know, the manufacturing industry has often been a laggard when it comes to investment in high tech solutions. I do think we're seeing that changing, as I mentioned earlier. And so for me, the most exciting part of looking to the future would be watching this accelerate, which I think that it will. Um, you know, technology is intimately tied to workforce development, um, especially in this industry. And it's, you know, it's taking these jobs that are repetitive and super hard on your body, and it's providing new ones that pertain to the tech side. And yes, this will require upskilling um, and the manufacturers will need to pay for that <laughs> uh, and offer that. But I do think that they're going to see the value in that investment. And um, and this, the side benefit of this digiti- di- digitization is that I think it does improve that industry overall perception as it becomes more and more tech forward. Um, and I think it, it serves as a retention tool as well. Uh, you know, younger workers are saying that if, if their workplace is not tech enabled, they will consider leaving and working somewhere else. Uh, manufacturers and distributors are seeing that. And so um, I think that that um, the acceleration that's already happening now will just continue to, to move forward full force. I'm hoping you mentioned AI. We're seeing uh, AI sort of. Uh, businesses and manufacturing finding the business case for AI, which they did not before. I think for a long time, it was like automation part two. They're like, what is this scary thing? What is it for? Um, now uh, we're seeing companies actually find ways to use that for um, predictive scheduling and inventory purposes. Um, so so more tech in the future, I think. And, and to me, that only strengthens the position of American manufacturing. Wonderful. Well, I think I can speak on behalf of our listeners in that we hope you're right, because I think those are great predictions. And then finally, Anna, um, what should listeners do if they want to learn more about more about you or where to follow you? Yeah, great. That's awesome. Um, So we have a a couple of great websites. IEN.com, which is for our, our uh, manufacturing brand, Industrial Equipment News. We also um, are featured on uh, manufacturing.net. Um, I'm on a podcast that airs every Thursday called the Today in Manufacturing Podcast. If anyone would like to check that out, it's just uh, uh, three of our editors on a panel talking about the top news stories that are impacting the manufacturing industry uh, that week. And we kind of provide some analysis on some of the factors that make those issues matter and, and you know, what, what we expect for the future. So if you want to check out the podcast, that would be great. We'd love it. Excellent. Very good. 
Well, thank you so much for joining me today. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Renee. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you have questions, send them to subject to challenge at legisglobalsolutions.com. Follow us on LinkedIn with the hashtag subject to challenge and learn more about AGS at allegisglobalsolutions.com, where you can subscribe to receive additional workforce insights. Until next time, cheers.